Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Patent Examiner Information Session event. My name is J.P. Gandhi, a Supervisory Patent Examiner, and I will be leading today's webinar. This one-hour information session will tell you everything you need to know about what the role of patent examiner is and its required qualifications. How this role supports the USPTO's mission. And why employees consider the USPTO a best place to work. Let's jump right in. I'm joined by two more members of the patent team, Andrew Flanders and Shelley Self. Both are supervisory patent examiner. I would like to introduce also Angela Cardona, who will be helping with the answer to your hiring specific questions. After the presentations, we will discuss the role we are hiring to fill in detail, the qualifications, as well as how and specifically where to apply before we begin taking questions. Here are a few housekeeping notes. Today's session has been recorded. If you have any questions to the participant or presenter, please use the chat feature. We will do our best to answer as many questions with the time that we have. But if you don't get your questions, we will be sure to follow up with you afterwards. To start off, we actually have questions for you. How did you hear about this event? Thank you, Jay. The USPTO is a great place to work and to build your career. Whether you're a new hire entering your first job out of college or an experienced professional, our agency has been regarded as one of the best places to work in the federal government. Next slide, please. Going over our agenda today, we're first going to talk a little bit about the USPTO's mission, different goals that our agency seeks to achieve, and the guiding principles that our agency operates under to promote this mission. Next, we'll discuss the various types of intellectual property law that may be afforded protection under US law or that one may be entitled to. Following that, uh, for those of you that may be currently unfamiliar with it, we'll be going over the patent process in general, explaining some of the background of what a patent is, as well as some of the features and aspects of the current process. Next, and maybe the most relevant item for all of you attending here today, we're gonna talk a little bit about the patent examination and training. We'll be discussing some of the responsibilities assigned to patent examiners, the tasks they perform on a day-to-day -day basis, the training they receive, and generally what to expect from the position. And last, we'll highlight some of the benefits of, of working for the USPTO. Our mission at the USPTO can be articulated in, in five different goals. And as a patent examiner, your efforts play a part on a daily basis and directly meeting these agency goals. You'll be the main point of contact for an applicant. You, you will facilitate the entire process from start to finish and provide the level of customer service necessary for them to obtain their patent. Your work from day to day will help to shape the current IP landscape. Each of these goals it can be broken down as follows. The first goal is to drive inclusive US innovation and global competitiveness. The second goal is to promote efficient delivery of reliable, intellectual property rights, promote the protection of IP against new and persistent threats, bring innovation to positive impact, and generate impactful employee and customer experiences by maximizing agency operations. So some of the guiding principles that we operate under here at the USPTO, um, first, through a culture of quality, we promote excellence throughout the organization by valuing accurate, and consistent results, primarily in the examination process. Through timeliness, we recognize the needs of our customers and stakeholders to have our products and services delivered at a time that meets their individual needs. Through efficiency, we are sound financial stewards of the user fees paid by our customers, and we use the lowest number of inputs to create the greatest number of outputs, maximizing results. Through effectiveness, we listen to our customers and stakeholders and incorporate their feedback. Through accountability, we measure our activities, accept responsibility for them, and disclose them in a transparent manner. The USPTO's main headquarters is located in Alexandria, Virginia, 
but there are also a number of satellite offices located across the country. In Dallas, Texas, Denver, Colorado, Detroit, Michigan, and San Jose, California. And while the agency has a number of offices around the country, our work workforce is truly a nationwide workforce. Our employees are located throughout the entire U.S. In fact, the, US, the USPTO has been at the forefront of teleworking for many years, well before the start of the pandemic. The agency was a leader in early adoption of full-time telework and has operated successfully within those constraints, with the vast majority of its employees teleworking for many, many years. And so next, we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of intellectual property available. So to start, the First thing are patents, and only inventions with utility or design can be patented, and they, and they will be disclosed to the public. The Patent Office examine these, examines these patent applications to determine whether the stringent requirements requ that are set forth in the laws and regulations are met in order to grant it. Uh, next, there are copyrights, and copyrights include, for example, literature, art, drama, music, photographs, recordings, broadcasts, and more. Trademarks are distinctive signs or indicators of the source of a product or service. For example, names, logos, colors applied to the owner's products or services, which seek to distinguish them from products or services offered by others or competitors. Uh, registered designs are another item that can be protected. Uh, it protects the external appearance of a product. They do not give any protection for the technical aspect. They include patterns, ornaments, and shapes. In order to be officially registered, Designs need to be original and distinctive. The artistic aspect of a design may also be protected by copyright. There are also what is considered unregistered designs, and these also enjoy some protection. An unregistered design is a free automatic right that you get when you present a design to the public. It gives you the right to stop anyone from copying your design, but typically the protection afforded by an unregistered design is more of a limited duration than that available for a registered design. And last, trade secrets. These cover information not known to the public. If the possessor of such information is careful to keep the information confidential, for example, by signing non-disclosure agreements with their employees and partners, they can sue anyone who steals it. However, trade secrets offer no protection against reverse engineering or against competitors who independently make the same invention. In your day-to-day -day life, you, you may come across IP and many of the products you use, for example, an Apple iPhone here, which contains, for example, some trademarks uh, made by Apple. The Apple uh, name and logo itself is, is a trademark, or the product, the iPhone 10, and the software, the, the iOS um, branding. It also can, it's also covered by a number of patents, for example, data processing methods, the different semiconductor circuits, chemical compounds, the battery, the power control, the antenna, the optics, and many other components of the device itself. There's also a number of copyrights afforded uh, the protection to the uh, elements of the iPhone. For example, software code, instruct the instruction manual itself, the ringtone, and the designs themselves, some of which are registered are also covered. Uh, the form of the, the overall phone, the placement of the camera, and some of the other things, like the trade secrets, uh, those are unknown, but may be covered by an NDA or something. So many of you may be wondering, what is a patent? Um, it is essentially a type of property right. It gives a patent holder a right, and this right is to exclude others from using, selling, offering for sale, or importing the claimed invention. And these rights are granted a limited term, depending on the specifics of the applicable laws that the application was filed under. The protection itself is territorial. It's only afforded in the territory that granted the patent. For example, the USPTO grants patents for the United States, and the protection of these patents is afforded in the US. There is no worldwide patent, however. On this slide, you'll see an example of an actual patent that an inventor receives once their application is approved and, and the patent is granted. The USPTO has issued its 10 millionth patent in June of 2018, and the 11th million patent was issued in May of 2021. And so the US system is a quid pro quo system. And what that means is the inventor is, uh, discloses his or her invention to the government in specific terms 
according to the applicable laws and regulations in exchange for exclusive rights to that invention which are protected by law for a period of 20 years from the date of the application. To promote the progress of science and useful art, the Founding Fathers provided a clause in the Constitution to provide inventors and authors for a limited time exclusive rights of their respective discoveries and writings, which means the Congress has the authority under the Constitution to provide us the laws that govern the Patent and Trademark Office. To that end, the authority that gives the USPTO the right to grant patents is set forth in Article I of the US Constitution itself, which states, Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors, inventors, the exclusive rights to the respective writings and discoveries. There are a number of reasons why an inventor may wish to seek patent protection, including to gain entry into or deter others from a market. They may use them as a marketing tool to promote unique aspects of a product. Uh, they're also used to assert or enforce their rights against an infringer or competitor and they can be used as collateral to obtain funding. They may also be used as, as an opportunity to create revenue uh, by selling or licensing that patent like any other property that you might do you use to do so. The patent system and patents themselves provide a number of benefits and impacts. Uh, for example, they ensure future in, inventive uh, stimulation and give inventors limited rights to their inventions. One of the most important benefits is the is that the public is provided with a disclosure of how to make and use the invention. Patenting requires publication so that it also accelerates the development of process, the development process of other inventions that others may discover by reviewing that patent itself. And finally, patents provide strength to our national economy. So who is eligible to apply for a US patent? Anyone from anywhere can apply for a US patent. Uh, the only people who may not apply are those employees of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Next slide. That was great, Andrew. Time for you, questions. What are you looking for in the next step of your career? Okay, thank you very much, JP. Um, and based upon the poll results, it looks like quite a few of you submitted flexibility, career growth, and advancement. So this is a wonderful segue into patent examining and training. So I wanna talk a little bit about becoming a patent examiner, um, what we do as patent examiners and training associated therewith. Um, basically, as a patent examiner, um, the examiner will take a look at all applications that are submitted and basically make a determination as to whether or not an application for a patent is new, useful, and novel. There are several different aspects to a patent application, including the claims, the title, the abstract, the specification, and the drawings. There may also be additional areas. But specifically, the claims are an extremely important part of the patent application, and they're ultimately what goes into what essentially becomes patented, because it is the claims that define the legal scope of the protection for the invention that is being sought. So here, we're gonna talk about a little roadmap to the process of an application going from a patent application to potentially an actual patent. So initially, an application is submitted to the USPTO at step one. Once it is submitted, a patent examiner will pick up that application, they will read it, they will analyze it, and they will establish some findings as to whether or not it may be patentable or some changes should be recommended. They will submit a written document to the applicant. That written document will encompass all of the patent examiner's initial findings, what prior art they went over, what search information they were able to find relative to whether or not it is actually new and novel, and maybe even some suggestions that the patent examiner would provide to potentially get the application to a patent. Once that written response is provided to the applicant, the applicant has an opportunity to respond back to the office. They can either amend or make some changes to their initial application based upon the initial findings that the examiner submitted. At that point, thank you, the patent examiner will take another look at what the applicant has submitted 
and they'll make a final determination as to whether or not the application can either be allowed or the applicant may decide to go to the appeal, excuse me, to the Board of Appeals to appeal the position that the examiner has taken if it is deemed that it is not allowable. So you'll see here this roadmap. It's a very linear roadmap and steps to which a patent application may get to the point of being allowed. So as I mentioned earlier, the claims determine the scope of the protection that is sought. Here is essentially a pyramid of how important the claims are. You'll notice at the top of the pyramid, it says too specific. At the bottom, it's too general. The job of a patent examiner is to basically find that sweet spot in the middle where claims are actually specific to the invention. If the claims are too specific, oftentimes a patent may not be particularly valuable or very difficult to enforce. If the claims are too general, then the patent application may not even be patentable. So our job, again, as patent examiners is to narrow the scope and make sure that the claims actually define what the true invention is so that we are issuing a patent on what the actual invention is, not one that is too broad, nor one that is too specific. So again, keeping in mind with the importance of claims, when a claim is broad, it may essentially just be to a housing. But you'll notice there are other steps here. There's additional information and additional limitations that can be added to a claim. In this scenario, in the red area, we have merely a housing. Well, a housing or a claim to a housing would not be patentable because that is entirely too broad and would encompass entirely too many different areas. But with additional limitations, i.e. with an opening in the green area, to receive a memory storage device is additional information that is added. And then finally, another limitation, wherein the storage device is an optical device. So you'll notice that as more limitations are added to the claim, the claim becomes more narrow and it gets more specific to actually what the claimed invention may be. So let's talk about um, an actual claim in the patent application. Next slide, please. So here we have an actual claim that was submitted in an application, and it is a claim for an apparatus for simulating a high five. You'll notice that the hand is actually pivotable from the left to the right. The first limitation is the first movable arm portion for simulating a forearm. And you'll see that in the rotated area to the right. The next limitation, a second immobile arm portion for simulating. You'll notice the immobile part is the lower part of the arm portion that is actually mounted to the left part of the wall. And that limitation is defined as a mounting arrangement for mounting said second arm and a pivot member, which can be seen at element 24 for pivotably securing. So this actually was an actual claim and an actual patent. And you'll see how the steps define it more narrowly so that it gets to exactly what the claimed invention may be. So as I mentioned, as a patent examiner, our job is to make sure that we review all of the sections in a patent application. I previously mentioned that that included the title, the abstract, the specification, and the drawings in conjunction with the claims, keeping in mind that it is the claims that determine the protection that is sought. So our job as patent examining is to read, analyze, understand the patent application, search for the evidence that the invention is known. And by searching, we're looking at things that are known out there. That can be something in another patent. It can be something in a trade journal. It can be something that is on the internet. It could even be a YouTube video. As long as it's known to the public, it very well may be considered prior art. After we've completed that search or that research aspect of the job, then we write up our legal office actions on whether or not patentability can be afforded. I've given you a little bit of an overall of the technical aspects of what we do as patent examiners. So now I'm gonna talk about an actual day in the life of a patent examiner. So we do offer extreme flexibilities here at the patent office and a patent examiner is responsible for managing their own schedule. When they get an application on their docket, we essentially pick up that application. The first thing we're gonna do is read it. 
We want to make sure that we fully understand what is going on in that application. We're going to take a look at the claims. We want to analyze them and make sure we know what is being claimed. And then the large part of our job is going to be the research aspect. We're going to spend a lot of time researching known intellectual property and known documents that are out there. We're going to look in our patent database. We're going to look at prior inventions this applicant may or may not have submitted. We're going to look at trade journals. We're going to look at non-patent literature. We're going to look at things that may be submitted in a textbook. We're going to do maybe some online searching, as I mentioned, relative to non-patent literature and um, maybe YouTube videos that's really come on lately in these last few years. So there's a number of things as patent examiners we're going to look at, and we're going to analyze those under the law, whether or not it is legally the same or whether or not there's a difference, but whether or not that difference may be a very small difference. If it's a very small difference, then we can take a position that it isn't patentable. So as a junior examiner, you're going to work one on one with an expert that's going to help you with that search process. So you're going to meet, you're going to consult, you're going to talk about your case, and you're going to come up with good ideas to do the research to be able to determine whether or not the application that you're looking at should actually be patented. And then you're going to write up your office action and send that out. So I would say 80% of your time as a patent examiner is doing reading and research, but it's a continual learning experience. So every time we as patent examiners pick up a new application, we're always learning and seeing something new and different. It's a very rewarding experience. Talk a little bit about becoming a patent examiner and what the requirements are. Having a technical degree or a technical education from an accredited institution is required and all applicants must be U.S. citizens. As I mentioned, we do a lot of writing, a lot of reading, and a lot of analyzing and a lot of research. So there's a particular skill set that we find to be particularly beneficial here at the Patent Office as a patent examiner. Want a strong technical background. Um, Want to be able to be analytical and resource oriented. Ability to make decisions. Got to be able to make a decision and make a determination and an ability to independently be able to manage your time. As I briefly mentioned earlier as a patent examiner, we do have flexibilities, but we do have a lot of requirements and a lot of work that has to be done within that time frame. So having good time management is essential to being a good patent examiner. Having good and excellent written and oral communication skills and having a focused attention to detail are all skill sets that we're looking for as a patent examiner. If you hold these skill sets, then you are a perfect candidate for being a good patent examiner. So in addition to skill sets that we're looking for, particular characteristics that we find to be beneficial. This is a collaborative work environment. As I mentioned, as new examiners, you'll work closely with experts in the area helping to determine good research strategies and searching strategies and having those consultations and conversations to be able to arrive at the best prior art to be able to make a determination as to whether or not what you're seeing in front of you in a patent application is truly and indeed should be granted a patent from the patent application. Collaborative, professional, curious. We're constantly learning, so we want you to have a curious nature. Um, ask questions, learn, look past what is in front of you, be persistent, open to continued improvement and feedback with that curious nature, ask questions, get those questions answered, take that feedback and apply it. Enjoy doing research. A lot of the job is autonomous, so you want to be able to enjoy reading and doing the research and enjoy writing, being able to clearly and effectively get your position across and pride in your individual accomplishments and the work that you submit. So these are desirable characteristics of a patent examiner. So the many benefits of being a patent examiner. Um, I mentioned that as a junior examiner, as a new examiner, all examiners start in the PTA, which is a patent training academy. It is both lecture and coursework. So you get an opportunity to get familiar with the different statutes that you would be applying to make a determination whether or not something is actually patentable and how to actually write your legal position, how to actually write 
and set forth your findings so that an applicant is able to fully understand your position and respond accordingly. We have non-competitive promotions to the GS-13. We have reasonable accommodations. I mentioned flexible work schedules, which allows examiners to set their schedule in a manner that they can be most productive. We offer wonderful career advancement and growth opportunities. There's optional paid overtime. We do have a competitive salary. We have training and mentoring opportunities in different programs throughout the agency. And we have various affinity groups, National Society of Black Engineers, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, HBC Unity, PTO Society, Agent Specific Network. We have a lot of different affinity groups here in the Patent Office. We have annual and quarterly performance awards. Yes, we do offer annual and quarterly performance awards. So if you want to strive for that, you can certainly be awarded that. And we offer educational reimbursement programs. There's a law school tuition reimbursement program and advanced technical degree, degree excuse me, tuition reimbursement programs. So I mentioned earlier that we're kind of a collegial environment and we support continued growth in education and advancement. These are programs that allow you to do that while continuing to work as a patent examiner. And we have our thrift savings program, our TSP, which is very similar to a 401k. And we have a pension annuity that is vested after five years of service. So we offer a complete compensation package and wonderful benefits here at the patent office. So in the poll, we had asked different areas of expertise. You'll see here, we have a number of areas where we are looking for knowledge and experience. These are vacancies that are currently open. They will be open through June 22nd of 23, and they are found at usajobs.gov. We're looking for backgrounds in physics, biomedical engineering, chemical engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, biology, chemistry and mechanical engineering. So a vast array of technical areas. We could certainly use your expertise. For the final question of the day, we would like to know, after attending today's event, are you going to apply to become a patent examiner at the USPTO? Okay, so wonderful, rah, rah, rah. We have a bunch of yeses. That's absolutely what we want to see. <laughs> and hopefully those of you who are on the fence, um, hopefully we can answer any questions that you have that will make you want to step over that fence and go on ahead and say, yes, you're going to apply. So here on this slide, you'll see a QR code, um, which will explain how to apply for becoming a patent examiner. So if you want to go ahead and scan that code in, that'll take you directly to the website where you can get more information about becoming a patent examiner and how to apply. And it'll take you directly there. So make sure you're scanning that in. And once you get it scanned in, bookmark it so that you have it. On this next slide here, um, this is another QR code that will offer you information on our various different programs, student programs, summer programs, and onboarding. So definitely scan this one into bookmark it so that you have it and you can go back to it and get in any information that you need. We want you to join our mailing list. You want to hear from us, scan this one in. It'll take you directly to the site where you can sign up to be on our mailing list where you can get information about the USPTO and vacancies that may be coming out. Hopefully now you have a better idea of what we do here at the Patent and Trademark Office and what it is to be a patent examiner. Hopefully we've answered some of those questions and hopefully you have some more for us and we would certainly love to be able to answer those. The first question is, what does a typical workload look like as a junior examiner and what does it usually look like as a senior examiner? How many patterns do you usually have on the desk at the same time? So I'll jump in a little bit on this one. Um, obviously, as a junior examiner, you have less experience. So you get more time to complete the review of a patent application. Typically, an experienced senior examiner um, is going to be able to analyze more patent applications um, in the same amount of time that a junior may be able to analyze them. But we understand that you're ramping up, you're learning the process, and what we're looking for for junior examiners is to be able to grasp the patent examining steps, 
to apply their technical knowledge and just be moving upward. So there isn't an exact number of how many may or may not be on a docket. It's gonna be directly related to the technology and the difficulty of the technology. Obviously for more difficult technology, more time is awarded to complete those applications. Next question is, are there age restrictions for applicants? Can you expand a little bit on that question? Restrictions? Yeah, are there age restrictions for the applicant? No. There's no restriction, right? There's absolutely no. How long the training at the academy? It's roughly four months. And after that four months, you transition into an art unit, into a more specified area and get an opportunity to work even more one-on-one -on -one with your supervisor or an expert in your particular area. Are hiring decisions only made after the June 23rd date? We are not waiting to the cutoff of the 23rd. That is the last cutoff, but we have been hiring. Um, we just did our fourth cutoff at 315. So our next cutoff, if you apply now, then you'll make it to the next cutoff. And for those that have previously applied, then um, your name keeps um, going to each referral. So meaning that if you didn't make the second cutoff, then your name will go back for the third cutoff for them to review it again. But your name stays active as long as the vacancy is open. Can I do a lateral? transfer as a working level GS-13 from another federal agency, direct hire authority available? So since these positions are open to all U.S. citizens and not direct hire eligibility, you can transfer over, but you would come in at the highest previous rate. So if you qualified for a seven, then your step would be a 10. If you qualified at a nine, your step would be, your grade would be a nine and your step would be a 10. But you can't come over on a 13 because that's not what's being advertised. And you still have to qualify for those positions and meet the basic education requirements as well. Can you be a part-time patent examiner? I'm a full-time electrical engineer, but I would be interested to do this as a part-time employee. These are full-time positions as advertised in the vacancies. Um, so after you submit, do your training, the four months training, there are some people that do go part-time, but again, that's um, patent examiners. They would have to elaborate on those individuals that are part-time, but this position is full-time advertised. If your technical area has overlap, with others, should you be applying to all areas or only the area in which you have degrees or certifications? If you have a background, um, educational and expertise in multiple technical areas, you're welcome to submit for multiple vacancies, as long as you're qualified. Would being a qualified as a patent attorney be a plus for the position? You would still need to meet the basic requirements as stated in the vacancy. So if you're applying for a physics, then you can qualify under other degrees, but you have to have 24 semester hours in physics. So you can apply for, um, if you're a patent uh, bar, bar attorney, it's not necessarily a plus, but it wasn't, it wouldn't hinder you as well. You still have to meet the education requirements. How long after the interview do you typically hear from whether you get the job? Two to three weeks. Do I have to work from Virginia or can I work virtually? We are currently onboarding examiners virtually. So you would not have to relocate, relocate to the Alexandria, Virginia area. Is there a benefit to passing the patent bar exam prior to applying or since the USPTO provides training, is it not necessary? It, it's not necessary to have passed the bar exam, but there are education requirements that has to be met regardless if you have a bar degree, 
um, if it, you're in chemical, you still have to have some type of engineering degree and have the courses. So each discipline has their own specialized experience and what the basic education requirements are. Is there anything you wish you knew before you become a patent examiner? I don't know that there's anything that I wish I knew before I became a patent examiner. Um, me personally, it's been extremely rewarding. Um, it is it's challenging, but because it's challenging, it, it is very rewarding. I would definitely say that time management, understanding the importance of time management is probably one of the most um, intangible aspects that you can have as an individual to being able to be successful here. I think I could add to one of the things that I would have liked to have known, um, perhaps, or one of the things that I stress to my examiners is the importance of being proactive with reaching out for uh, help from your colleagues and, and other uh, more experienced examiners. So I, I would have, I, I suppose I would have liked to know the how important it was to do that in order to be successful. Do you need to have passed the bar exam prior to applying for the patent examiner position? No. After achieving full GS-13, what are the different career path opportunities? So once you reach, uh, reach GS-13, uh, you're still considered a junior examiner, but at that point, uh, you can begin what's called the signature program. Uh, and it, what that is, is basically a two-year rigorous program where your work is heavily scrutinized, and then the office will make a determination whether or not you should be granted signature authority. And if you pass that program, you are promoted to GS-14. And once you've reach primary examiner at GS-14, that opens the door to a number of other positions, um, quality assurance, um, uh, supervisory positions, and many, many other different opportunities throughout the office. Can I apply if I have a patent pending? So um, there's something like a confidential filer report for conflict of interest. So that would need, have something to be discussed um, when you apply. You would have to let us know that in the beginning, and it can be a conflict of interest. How do you prove educational qualifications if my area of expertise was not listed with the current opening? Should I not apply at this time? So if you're schooling, you went to school over 20 years ago, um, hopefully the school is still open and you'll be able to get your transcripts because we would need transcripts or if you have foreign education, you would need an evaluation done, but we would need some type of transcripts to verify that you have completed schooling and have met the education background. For a PhD in biology with multiple years in research, what the lowest GSA can someone be hired on? A GS9. If you took the courses over 20 years ago, do they qualify? As long as it meets the basic education requirements, we would need the transcripts to um, verify that. What aspects of the job tends to take up the most of your time? Which aspect of the job tends to be most tedious for you? and which aspect of the job you enjoy the most? So that's a good question. Uh, I think it really depends on what point you're at in your career as an examiner. Um, you know, a, a new examiner, probably the things that take up the most time are understanding the technology and understanding an application, reading through it, trying to really grasp what the applicant is claiming and, and trying to disclose. Um, once you get better and more familiar with the technology, I think, the thing that takes up the most time is probably searching and, and identifying the the prior art that exists that is relevant to the the application at hand. Um, as far as the tedious aspects, um, maybe some of the paperwork, some of the, filling out some of the forms that are that are necessary. 
Um, and I suppose the aspects that I enjoy the most uh, when I that I did enjoy the most when I was a patent examiner was the opportunity to hold what are called interviews or which are basically a teleconference with with the applicant where they have an opportunity to talk about their application and you, you, you have an opportunity to engage them and understand you know where they're coming from and, and work with them uh, to, to get their patent approved. So I would agree with everything that Andrew said. One thing that I would add is say when you're a new examiner, um, one of the tedious things might be that recognizing that every application is different. So every application is reviewed and looked at. Everything is a case by case basis. So exactly how you did the previous application, there might need to be some slight differences or considerations put forth. But as you become more experienced, you get in a rhythm and you get more comfortable with that. Do you have to have an, an engineering degree to be a patent examiner? Your degree does not have to um, necessarily be in engineering, but you still would have to meet the qualifications um, for that discipline. Each discipline has their own um, specialized experience in their own requirements. So it's best to review the vacancy of the discipline that you're interested in and see if you would meet that, those basic education requirements. Would you recommend someone with a 10 years professional engineering experience to switch career to a career as a patent examiner? Would it be big financial compensation difference to start? So I, I would say I, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed my time here at the patent office. I think it's a great career. I think there's a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things. It's been a very fulfilling position. Um, it's, it's one of probably one of the most flexible positions out there for engineers. Um, whether or not it would be a big financial compensation difference, would, it's, it's somewhat tough to say. It really depends on where what which yes level you come in at and also what your you know your prior compensation might be. Yeah, so I totally agree. I mean I can speak from my own personal experience. I came here from private industry engineering. My background is mechanical and aerospace and I did that in private industry for a number of years. I enjoyed that very much and I elected to take a different path and come here to the patent office. I've been here much longer now than I ever was in the private sector. I have found it extremely rewarding. Um, I have absolutely no regrets. It's been a wonderful career, um, wonderful opportunities for advancement and growth. And while I've been here over 20 years, I feel like one, the 20 years has gone fast and two, that I'm constantly learning. I don't ever feel like I'm stagnant. So that is something that I find great reward um, with. Our spring 2023 graduates encouraged to apply. Yes, definitely. We're encouraging everyone to apply. Even if you have a graduation date for the fall, we're still encouraging everyone to apply. Wow, those were some really great questions. Thank you all for attending. We had a great time providing information about our open patent examiner positions. Now that you have some information, it's time to take some action. View the QR code seen here and follow the link to apply right now. The vacancies will be open till June 22nd, 2023. If you have any question as you begin your application process, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at recruitment at uspto.gov which is recruitment at uspto.gov. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you all. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, thank Goodbye. you, everyone. Bye.